Hello all and welcome to our fourth webinar from the Match Project. My name is Lasse Tyson and I am your host throughout this uh, series of webinars. We have dedicated one hour per day to talk about uh, readiness for circular economy and some of the key dimensions to keep in mind when you as a company are considering to make this uh, transition to the circular economy. Since Monday, we have hosted three uh, webinars one was a general introduction to the match platform and then yesterday the dimension of organization followed by strategy and business model innovation they are all available on our website if you just go to a match.dk and then select webinars you can find an overview of all the webinars this and the coming episodes will be recorded as well and available uh, later the same evening during today's presentation, we will use the Q&A function like in the other webinars, and you can find that uh, in the bottom of your uh, screen. The chat is open for you to present yourself, and I can see a lot of people have already done so. That's really nice. It's uh, important for us to get to know who we have on board as well. Um, you can also use this chat to just share any relevant knowledge for the rest of the group. Remember that uh, this is a room full of uh, circular economy geeks. The agenda today is that we will spend 20 minutes on the topic of product and service innovation. And then we finish the presentation with a case example from a, a Danish company. This leaves us with hopefully 10 minutes for the Q&A session and plenty of dialogue. We will then do a quick three minute uh, transition and you can use that as a break. We will uh, transition to our second topic of the day which is manufacturing and value chain. Some participants might join us for the second part only, so I will do a quick recap on uh, some of the information that I'm giving you right now. But the Zoom link is the same, so you can just stay on the line and go grab some coffee in the kitchen. Now, the first topic is a uh, product and service innovation, and that will be presented by Professor Tim McAloon, who is the lead of the Match Project. His uh, research is focused on sharing economy, sustainability, and circular economy. For more than 20 years, he has been teaching the course Product Service Systems here at DTU. I was a student there once. And in 2017, he was awarded the title of DTU Teacher of the Year uh, for his teaching in exactly that course and some other sustainability related courses. He will be uh, supported by our colleague, uh, Professor Daniela Vigoso, who has combined her background in environmental and industrial engineering. So very similar to Tim, she is focused on eco design, sustainability and circular economy. With that said, I will hand it right over to you, Tim. Thank you, Leza. And good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. I can see there's some from the US and I think there's some in Asia as well. So good evening to you. Again, it's a pleasure to be here and to share some insights from our match project together with you. And uh, the first one now for the first half hour is product and service innovation. So, and <clears throat> as Lessa mentioned, this is part of a, 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 a large series of uh, nine webinars and uh, the first one just now and in uh, half an hour's time, Daniel will take over on manufacturing and value chain. So the first question that uh, uh, you may ask is, well, uh, why products and service innovation in terms of circular economy? Well, it's a, a well-cited um, statement that around about 80% of all environmental impacts in the product life cycle are defined in the early design stages. Um, this is an estimation. I'm not sure how many scientific studies have been done in that, but it follows the Pareto rule of the 80-20. And uh, this is closely followed uh, by the uh, looking at the where we embed costs into our products. It's also in the design office, um, but it's there where we have the most freedom of choice and freedom of, of movement. So that's one reason, of course, why we should look at products and service innovation in a circular economy context, because the products and services we're going to be designing um, are, this is where we have the opportunity to design them for circularity. And it could be everything from the technology in the products to the way in which the product is structured and built up and, and the, uh, the modules and the components within the product designed for upgrade, reuse, recycling, and so forth. And it can also be the design of the service which goes together with the product. 
in order to maybe lengthen the product's life, to be able to monitor the product throughout its life cycle, and so on and so forth. So this is why this is actually an extremely important area to, to focus on for circularity. Now, I'd like to share another motivation with you about um, why or what the, the goal of uh, circularity is. And Nancy Bock and one of our good friends from the Netherlands has a nice way of describing three strategies towards circular economy. One is about narrowing loops, which means that one strategy uh, can be to decrease overall material use, regardless of the uh, end of useful life scenario. So that is making things uh, more efficient and, and, and making the uh, usage of uh, materials in each product uh, as, as low as possible. The second strategy can be to what she's, uh, Nancy Bocken is calling slowing loops. This is about extending the time in which the materials are uh, actually actively and valuably, valuably uh, being used in their uh, lifetimes. And when they are uh, coming to the end of the first useful life, seeing if we can recirculate. So this is slowing loops. And then the third strategy is uh, what Nancy is calling closing loops, which is, I guess, the thing that comes to mind when uh, most people, to uh, when they're hearing circular economy for the first time, are thinking about first, which is about looking to increase the proportion of materials captured before we actually dispose. This is from the linear to the circular. And these three strategies, of course, are not exclusive to each other. The absolute panacea is to try and go for all three at the same time. And how do we do that? How do we both narrow the loops, slow loops, and close loops? Sometimes we'll have conflicts and trade-offs within the design process, and other times it's possible. And by looking in the early design process at the products and service innovation, maybe we can design some products and services together in order to make these uh, three strategies uh, coincide in a positive way. So the whole idea here is how do we keep providing value to the user, but decouple that from resource consumption? So this fits very well with the SDG number 12 about responsible consumption and production as well. So that's the motivation for uh, why to look at this here. Within our um, match uh, uh, profile, our match um, uh, portal here, we have uh, a focus on products and service innovation, where we're defining the readiness of products and service innovation for a company as being measuring the capabilities necessary to develop new solutions, including products and services that are suitable in a circular economy context. And within that particular uh, question within the platform um, or that dimension, we ask you a number of questions here. First of all, to what extent is your company or your business unit developing and delivering product service systems? This is the combined product and service delivery. How, uh, to what extent are we designing and considering designing those into our uh, product development process? For example, services supporting the product use, subscriptions, sharing solutions, renting instead of owning, and so forth. So that's the first aspect of this dimension. The second aspect is asking, how far is your company in developing products and services that consider extending the lifetime? And this is the, some of the design for X uh, issues I was talking about before, design for maintenance, design for modularity, design for upgrade, and so on and so forth. The third area, the third aspect is about how far is the company in term, uh, terms of developing products and services to uh, consider the end of life or the end of use, as we are increasingly calling it, of our products so that when they actually do come to the end of useful life, we can dis uh, dismantle them, we can uh, remanufacture, we can refurbish some parts, and then maybe even recycle if we don't manage to uh, do the more value uh, preserving activities. So to avoid letting the products and the materials within the products reach the uh, back into the linear economy, you could say into the, uh, the disposal um, chain. And then the fourth question here is about how far is your company in developing products and services that can be shared with other users? So this could be car and bike sharing, sharing of clothing, sharing of equipment, and so on and so forth, car sharing, etc. So those are the um, the, the, the areas that um, we're asking you about within the, the match platform and four areas that are interesting to, to, to consider. 
So how about some examples here? And we've taken four examples of uh, actually companies that we have some uh, connection to uh, here in, De uh, in Denmark and in, in at DTU. The first one, this is, if you look to the right hand side of this picture, you can see some shipping containers. And uh, to the left, you can see uh, some, uh, actually some houses, some student houses, which look exactly the same shape as a shipping container. And that's because they're shipping containers. So this company, Copenhagen Village, has made a, a fantastic uh, business out of actually uh, what they're calling circular living. So uh, student accommodation, uh, cheap and affordable accommodation for uh, students to live in using uh, reused shipping containers, which for some reason or other can't be used as shipping containers anymore uh, because they've come to the end of their useful life. But on top of that, what the company is uh, intending to do and starting to do is to say, how about if we can not buy the windows, but lease them? How about if we can not buy the heating system, but have a heating as a service? And how about uh, any of the other utilities and components? Could we have them as uh, purchasing product service systems because these are temporary living areas that have a permission to, to, to be in the places they are for a maximum of 10 years uh, because the uh, the student accommodation here is put in areas which are, are going to be developed but not, not yet developed within the city of Copenhagen. And these guys have a, a very nice ambition of, uh, of expanding this to, to other cities and other areas. The second Example we have here, you can see some, some green cans in here, but there's lots of uh, beverage uh, cans coming to the end of uh, use and end of life here. This is a wish from Carlsberg to um, re remove what they call branded waste. How can we go from uh, a branded waste uh, problem to an opportunity by looking at designing and developing a different type of beverage packaging? And we've been involved some years ago uh, with them on a project to make what we called then the green fiber bottle uh, here at DTU and today that's become a company on in its own right called the paper bottle company or Paboco which Carlsberg and a number of other large organizations have uh, ventured into together to see how can we move the packaging problem uh, from the techno cycle to the bio cycle of the uh, circular economy butterfly which you you may know so the techno cycle on the one side and the bio cycle on the other side. So this is again, very much about the design, design of the technology, design of the life cycle and designing waste out of the system. And the idea is to, to be able to get these back and to reuse uh, the, uh, the bio materials from there. The third area started actually as a student project many years ago here at DTU where some students were looking at um, the problem of how do we transfer, transport vaccines to uh, developing countries. Um, this was a project that was started by UNICEF. Um, they had a goal of reaching the reaching the fifth child, it was called. So 80% of the vaccines got there on time. Uh, not sorry, not on time, but uh, unspoilt. But 20% were either uh, had been too cold in the cold chain or had actually uh, gone above the uh, permitted temperature. And here you can see a number of single use temperature devices like this one as well. And these are basically electronic devices which become thrown out uh, in the village where they arrive within the, the, the vaccine packaging. And uh, some students started to look at this and they're cutting a long story short. Today, we have a company uh, here in, uh, in Denmark called, uh, called Upri. Uh, they're, they're functioning within uh, this part of the world. They need to prove their, their, their products and the business within the, the developed economy and becoming quite instrumental just now actually in terms of uh, shipping vaccines uh, around. And this is basically temperature as a service. So a device uh, connected with logging in and, and monitoring and giving temperature as a service and having this device as a, uh, a, a lasting device, which is not a, a, a single use uh, device here. And then the final example, uh, a company you may know, uh, we've worked also together with, uh, with the, these guys. Uh, this could have been my uh, shoe from the 1970s. Uh, this is the, uh, the Adidas uh, classic. Uh, today, Adidas have moved through a number of activities and a number of, uh, of different uh, products where they, they're they reaching a, a product today which is made out of one type of material and no glue whatsoever. So it's a, a, a thermoplastic uh, material, uh, material which is making this beautiful shoe uh, and their goal is simply no glue and no uh, or as fewer uh, multiple materials as possible understanding and accepting that they're in a, a fast fashion market 
but also trying to change the market at the same time as they're changing the, the product through materials design and different joining techniques. So there's some inspiration for you there uh, in terms of examples. But um, what I'd like to do now is to ask Daniela to share with us some of what we found from the, the match project in terms of how it's actually going with the companies that we've had in the platform uh, what is the readiness within this particular dimension of product and service innovation? And what are the areas of uh, improvement possibility? So over to you, Daniela. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. And uh, this data that I'm going to share with you just now, it comes from all the different companies that are in the Match platform uh, today. So we have more than 700 users uh, from more than 330 companies over the six continents. So it's a quite good uh, representation of companies from a business to consumer, a business to business, and also a business to government types. And what we see here for product and service innovation, this is actually the third highest uh, score across the eight dimensions that we have in match. And we have a little bit over 42% uh, percent, uh, in terms of the overall total readiness they could have in here. So we have 8.5 out of 20 points. And the way we are calculating those points, they are following a five scale uh, approach to measure readiness that goes from not having started and still understanding the potential all the way through scaling up uh, the initiatives. So let's have a look how it looks in relation to the four main areas that Tim just mentioned. What we can see here is that the two highest uh, redness that we can see in industry today, they are in design for life extension. So designing products where we can provide maintenance, we can change spare parts, and we can keep them providing the functions they were developed for, for as long as possible. Uh, in this strategy specifically, we can see a very nice distribution of companies that are already scaling up uh, initiatives and putting the products out there in the market. And I guess Tim just presented some very nice examples uh, of that. But we can also see a very nice pipeline of companies that are piloting uh, new initiatives just now and planning the scale up implementation as well. The second highest uh, area in here is the design for end of life. Eventually, those products will reach a phase where it's not possible to keep repairing, providing maintenance and so forth. And then it's important to look at some other strategies such as design for disassembly, design for remanufacturing, design for refurbishment and also design for recycling. And what we can see here is that we also have lots of companies that are ready at a higher readiness. So either piloting, scaling up, uh, or having a full implementation. But we can also see quite a lot of companies planning the pilot implementation, which shows to us that we should expect to see more and more products in the market that are designed for uh, a circular economy. The other two areas that we have in here that have a lower uh, readiness in comparison to the two that I just presented are the ones more connected to uh, this service element. So moving manufacturing companies from selling products to providing the function of those products by product service systems, for instance. And what we can see here, it's an average of two, which means planning the pilot implementation uh, we can see that the majority of companies have not started yet and are still trying to understand the potential. And we really see that as a trend. So usually companies tend to focus on their products first to ensure that they are circular and that they can uh, provide value for a longer time. And then on top of that, they come with new business models and product service systems that will build upon those technical uh, characteristics of the products. Um, and then we can also see here that design for sharing is the uh, area with the lowest redness so far, uh, where the large majority of companies are still trying to understand the potential and have not started yet. Let's have a look now from a company type point of view. 
And what we can see here that is quite different from the webinars from uh, the last two days is that the highest readiness in here can be seen in business to government uh, organizations with a total readiness of uh, 13. And they are extremely strong in both product service systems and also designed for life extension. We can see business to consumer companies as the second highest uh, with a stronger focus on design for end of life and design for life extension. Now, if you look into uh, the size of the companies and how ready they are, we can see that the micro companies, those with less than 10 employees, uh, potentially startups, really have uh, the starting point in circular products. They have the highest uh, readiness here. And if we look sector by sector, we can see that the top four ones are food and beverage, building materials, machinery, and also motor vehicles. And I just want to show one more interesting piece of information here. So if we click to see what are the companies that are scaling up product service systems today, we can see that they, they are also the ones designing for life extension. And that's extremely important. At the time that we move our business models from selling products to providing them as a service, uh, user behavior will potentially change as well which might lead to a lower lifetime of products in order to be able to ensure that circularity will also be more sustainable. We need to look at those two areas at the same time. So we can see here again, a very good trend on how companies are combining different strategies to innovate in their products uh, and services. Okay, back to you, Tim. Thanks, Daniela. So what I'd like to do is finish off with a, a small case uh, from one of the companies that has been on our accelerator program uh, together with us uh, on the match project. And here you can see the, the logo in the background, uh, Oticon. And Oticon is a brand under the company Demant, uh, one of the world's largest hearing aid manufacturers uh, here in Denmark. And they were one of the case companies on the, the match project where we went through again this is the one of the first meetings you can see on the screens there uh, doing the the readiness profile and after this we looked actually into a project where we looked very very deep into the uh, circularity of not the the hearing aid which is what they they uh, produce but the packaging and uh, if you imagine these very tiny hearing aids uh, that's uh, that's one thing in terms of how can we make those more circular or, or more environmentally sustainability better uh, that's difficult because they're quite optimized already but in terms of the packaging there's many opportunities that we saw there you can imagine through the lifetime of one hearing aid uh, and actually we normally have two when we need them uh, finally then uh, we have the battery and the, and the blister packs for the battery we have the the small domes to to put in the ears we have the actual hearing aid uh, casing not to mention all of the internal logistics packaging and we saw lots of opportunities there to, to really cut a lot of waste. And the waste was simply just a cost, an internal cost for the company. Because of course the company, uh, sorry, the customer or the user uh, isn't paying for the packaging with, uh, with hearing aids. Uh, and very many places in the world, the hearing aids are coming either subsidized or paid by the state as well. So packaging here is just simply a, a, a waste to cut down. And we saw lots of great opportunities here. You can see this case in depth uh, on the Match uh, website. So with that, the time is running as it does uh, in these uh, when we're having fun. Uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Lessa to see if there's any questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to answer them for you. Thank you, Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of questions are rolling in and unfortunately, I don't think we have time to answer all of them. But the first question, Tim, is uh, for you. That's from uh, Fasane. And she asks if circular economy transition can be implemented with a top-down management approach. So imagine you're a designer, you sit there, you're really ambitious, but you, you can't really. Can we empower those designers somehow? Yeah, that's a really nice question, uh, Fazani. So I think that that you're right. It's nice to encourage um, innovativeness and encourage creativity within the uh, the organization. I think that, that it's a bit of a chicken and egg. So I think uh, many good examples and good cases that we've seen have come from a part of the organization which is not the top management, but at some stage 
especially in this particular dimension in terms of the product and service uh, design, we need to have uh, to start to get some structure on the activities. Yesterday, we talked about uh, the organizational readiness for, for circular economy. And I think that this question is extremely relevant in, in that uh, context, in terms of how do we start to organize the way in which we uh, support the processes and what investment from a resource perspective we're putting into this. One thing I can say is that uh, I've been working with sustainability for the last uh, 26, 27 years. And the circular economy uh, focus is really bringing a lot of um, openness and a lot of opportunity and an innovation culture to the whole field of sustainability, which I haven't seen before. So that's the positive part. And that uh, gives the, the possibility for uh, people in, in the, uh, the whole organization to, to, to come along and, and uh, give it a go. And Tim, in thread with what you just said about the innovation of the circular economy topic, mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, elaborate on quickly what is the difference between sharing economy and product service systems, if any? Yeah, you could say the sharing economy share is, is a type of product service system. So uh, a, a product that you share, for example, out in the car park, uh, we have uh, a, a car sharing system, uh, Share Now, which is part owned by BMW and Mercedes. And uh, that's a sharing product service system. But uh, there's also product service systems with um, um, machinery uh, maintenance with all different types of them. So the sharing economy is, is one part, one type of a product service system. And we have a whole range of them, uh, of, of product service systems. Thank you. I have two questions uh, left that I would like to answer before we run out of time, and they're going to be to you, Daniela. Uh, first, we get a lot of questions about this infographic and the statistics and whether that is available. That's the first question. The second question is, why is sharing a uh, design for sharing so low in your figures? Mm -hmm. Let me start with the second uh, to link with the answer from Tim um, just now. Um, and I, I agree with you that it's really uh, interesting because we have so many sharing systems out there almost every day you hear about a new sharing system that you can join not least to talk about all of the mobility systems out there scooters cars and all of it but what we see is that companies they are actually putting out those business models without redesigning their products to do so which is quite of a big issue if you look at the overall lifetime of these scooters it's really low. It's about two to three weeks that they are uh, on the streets serving to the purpose of moving people from A to B. Can we really design them better so that they can last longer, which should be a win-win situation both for the environment, but also for the profitability of those companies. So we really hope that in the near future, companies will start focusing more on designing products for sharing systems to make them more robust and to extend their overall lifetime. Now, in relation to the data, all the companies that do their assessment in the match platform, they've had, they have access to two main uh, data points. The first one is an internal benchmarking where they can compare themselves uh, in relation to different business units in the organization. And it's really helpful for knowledge sharing, for harmonization of circular economy strategy, and also for internal collaboration. But what companies can also do is to benchmark themselves with other companies, maybe in the same sector or the same region, the same size, or um, the same type of business. They will, of course, never be able to know who are the other companies. It's all anonymized um, information, but they will have a quite good understanding of how they are in relation to other companies in the same context. And this will provide a very nice insight as well on how to prioritize their initiatives for enhancing their circular economy readiness. Thank you, Daniela. So yes, you can go to the match uh, platform and you can benchmark your company the actual tool that Daniela was using uh, is not available currently, but we're looking into a, a way to share it with you, maybe. Um, I think this is the end of our first topic for today. We will do a three minute transition to the next, uh, to the next topic of the manufacturing and value chain. So thank you so much for all your questions. It's uh, really nice to see so much engagement. Stay on the line uh, and we will be back in just a few minutes for the next topic of today.